There are a lot of video games where the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche shows up, but three sprang to mind immediately when I was researching his philosophy for this video. Nier Automata, Final Fantasy X, and Dragon's Dogma. I want to talk about Dragon's Dogma because there is so little out there on the analysis of its themes and it is so thematically dense. And I want to start by addressing the elephant of philosophy everyone seems to want to avoid. So for this video I hope to answer the question what is the Dragon's Dogma and why do I think it's so heavily related to the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Let's start at the beginning. Or rather, a bit before that. Before beginning the game proper, you get a bit of a preview as a previous Arisen named Sivan on their way to fight the dragon. Then we get to create our own character. You start in the village of Cassidus, in the land of Grancis where you make your living catching fish. The great dragon Grigori attacks, destroying large portions of the docks, burning some people, and terrifying everyone. You pick up a sword and fight admirably. but are unable to pierce the dragon's scales until the dragon swipes with a claw gets the sword stuck in his paw. He then quite literally steals your heart, both in game and in real life, turning you into an arisen, an immortal being bound by fate to fight the dragon. You leave the village and in a nearby encampment you are attacked by a hydra, a giant snake with four heads. After you cut off one of the heads, it flees and Mercedes, the captain of a force from Hearthstone, sent as aid against the dragon, suggests taking the head as a tribute and proof of strength to the duke. And here we get our first bit of thematic analysis. The fact that they chose a hydra, this multi-headed serpent, may clue in an audience familiar with Japanese mythology that the tale of Suzano's slaying of Orochi will be relevant to this game. A very astute player may even be considering Final Fantasy X, in which the overarching story is at once this very tale and also heavily influenced by Nietzsche. In the tale, Susano, after being kicked out of heaven, comes across a couple and their daughter, all of whom are weeping. When he asks why, they explain that the eight-headed serpent Orochi comes once a year and eats one of their daughters, and it is now the time for the serpent to come and eat the last of their daughters. So Susano comes up with a plan, and they get the serpent drunk and lull it to sleep, and he cuts it to pieces. The primary theme of Susano and Orochi is a clash between tradition and pragmatism. The tradition of sacrificing a daughter to avoid the wrath of Orochi is challenged by Susano, and because of his practicality and his willingness to go against tradition and against authority, he is able to slay this old god and free the couple from its tyranny. I note here that Susano did not require any particular prowess to do so. He didn't need to level grind to 200. He didn't need to master the sphere grid. All he did was get the serpent drunk and then cut it to pieces. Anyone with the willingness to do so could have done the same. Now Japan is much more socially minded and much less individualistically minded than the average country, and there is a cultural tendency to submit to authority and to tradition. This makes it so that a malicious authority, such as a giant serpent, or a large corporation, or an economic system which suppresses individuality, can be difficult to rally against, because nobody wants to go up against the group, and the group is by default perceived as wanting to stick with tradition. For this reason, nuance, indirect language, and metaphor are highly valuable for building movements and organizing. 
So the reason we see the tale of Susan of slaying Orochi being related here in Final Fantasy X in many of the Dragon Quest games and many other video games is because it is a cultural symbol that there is a tradition and an authority that needs to be thrown off and discarded. And in the West, the philosopher who most embodies the idea of eschewing tradition and killing the god of the era is the one that famously said, God is dead, and we have killed him. Let's get back to the story. You get some pawns by your side, who beings without a will. And you make for the capital, Grand Soren, to gain an audience with Duke Edmund Dragonsbane. He sees you as a threat to his political power, and so he uses the machinations of the political system to distract and delay you from facing the dragon as much as possible. So you do various tasks, some for the Duke, some for various other people. But all throughout the game, you are making choices, whether you know it or not. As Haruo Murata, scenario designer for Dragon's Dogma, put it, This game is a me-only experience. Being someone that is not passive is the largest choice. In Dragon's Dogma, there are several areas to make big and small choices. You may not even realize you made a choice at some points. The player progresses through the story like the movement of a bow. The biggest choice you can make in this game is a very difficult one. The big climax in the latter half of the game pivots on the player's actions up until that point. How they spent their time, what decisions they made, and forces him or her to think about how to live on. When you get there, you don't just feel the flow of a predetermined story. You savor the idea that someone will experience this decision. And I do have to say, part of the genius of Dragon's Dogma is that at every point you can make small changes here and there, but those small changes can add up and lead to larger results. It would be nice if they had been given the development time and resources to finish everything they wanted to do in that regard, and I'm really looking forward to what they do with Dragon's Dogma 2. But even so, the ability to make a large difference while feeling so small is something that really resonates with me, and they did a great job with that. So at this point, the game really opens up. And in order to understand Nietzsche, we need to understand the traditions he was fighting against. There are two primary philosophies and associated religions he was trying to cast away. Christianity, with the influence of Immanuel Kant, and Buddhism, with the influence of Arthur Schopenhauer. Let's look at Kant and this game's caricature of Kant first. In Grand Soren, there's an NPC that stands out named Bodrick. And he says very interesting things throughout the game. I've gone ahead and collected footage of all of them, which I have confirmed by checking the game's files. The dragon approaches his voice like a wind. I see him. I hear him. He comes. His mouth holds the fire. And his eyes keep the smoke, while his wings beat like terrible drums! <laughs> I die. You die? We never shall die. To die, one must first be alive. If never we lived, which never we did, why then, uh, there is no death to contrive. <laughs> the dead can't die. The dead can't live. The dead can only be dead. As we are not here and have passed out of time, it's for others to die in our stead. <laughs> the death and destruction has wrought by the dragon is nothing that mortals need here. <laughs> the world is a lie, an illusion, says I, and something we need not hold dear. <laughs> illusion! Illusion! Lies and deceit, a ripple cast forth by a wave. This world is but smoke in the night from a fire. The people know more than its slaves. You live, you say. You claim this true? Then I have a question for thee. What does it do to say one's alive, if you cannot yet say what it means? 
Prove you are here. Prove you exist. Prove that I stand here in kind. You cannot prove thus, because then I could claim to be sprung from your own adult mind. <laughs> you name me mad? Oh, no. I'm not mad. I'm the sanest man you'll ever see. <laughs> this crisis arisen springs from your hand. And thus, you must make us all free! Alive? Alive! Such talk of alive! It's all become rather a bore. You should, like the birds or the beasts of the fields, Take fret in such things never more. Do you stand before me? Do you see me too? Or is this some terrible jape? The Maker can't save you. If he isn't there, no matter how you bend and you scrape. <laughs> you claim that you live. Just by thinking it so. But such thoughts are wicked and sad. To never consider that you might be false is a path trod by only the mad! Dragon? What dragon? The one in the sky? One whom you seek to defeat? You swore to this oath, and yet foolish it was, for our lives are but chaff from the wheat! None can command you, none can enslave you, none must you swear to obey. Even the dragon cannot force such a deed once you learn all life is a play. You need not go on. Your road is not set. You can all your duties forswear. The way of arisen is different for each. Yet by duty has your heart been ensnared. You hope when you plunge your sword deep in the worm, that it then goes the way of all flesh. But like a court jester, the jape is on you. Once you learn that life then starts afresh! I see through your eyes and look straight at your heart and find it's wrapped tightly in doubt. I cannot speak falsely, and this pleases me some. But it shows my words taken sprout. Believe in your fear. Keep it deep in your heart. Clutch it close to your breast like a swain. Fear's all that is real in this world of pretend, despite what priests claim at the fane. We arrive at the end. The death of the real. The end of the start of the lie. The scales from your eyes soon will fall away. And you'll see what you cannot deny. <laughs> Don't lift. Tall enough. Empty void. And when you set foot in that terrible place, what faith you claim will be destroyed! <laughs> only mortals know death, only mortals know life. And alas, you can none of these be. Pray fly, fair arisen! Fly fast to your rift! Wherefore emptiness might set you free. According to Kant, you cannot perceive the world as it is because your perception of the world is mediated by your mind, and because your mind is a part of the world, it cannot disentangle itself from it to get an objective view of reality. So, for example, what would a world without minds look like? It is impossible.
A world without minds couldn't look like anything because there are no minds there to perceive it. So the senses cannot give knowledge of objective reality. Kant then says that we must use reason to find out anything about objective reality and reasons himself into believing in God. And he uses that to build into a sort of Christianity, heavily emphasizing an ethics of duty. Now let's take a look at this game's caricature of Schopenhauer. One quest you can take at this point has you finding out more about a cult in the area, Salvation, run by the Elysian, who you may remember as the jerk who unleashed the Hydra upon you earlier on. Before crashing his party, you can listen to his sermon. For it is fear which rarefies and distills the soul unto its right way, lofty character. Schopenhauer came along a bit after Kant and agreed that perceiving objective reality is impossible. But he found a different way out of this issue. Our minds interact with the world in two different ways. We have our sensory perceptions, but we also have an ability to use our will, to command ourselves. In essence, these great philosophers were having a playground argument, with Kant saying, prove you exist, and Schopenhauer punching him. But Schopenhauer saw that that by itself doesn't get you very far. If all you can find out about the world is through willing things, that doesn't really say much. Unless, well, what if the world is will? The will to survive, he called it. From here he goes into a sort of philosophical Buddhism, saying that our perceptions lie to us and tell us that there are many things, but in actuality we're like all one being, dude. And since all is one, any act of violence is an act of self-violence. So when we seek pleasure, that causes pain elsewhere. 
So we must always be kind to each other and just not seek pleasure. And you know, there can be no end to suffering so long as the world exists. So one should not reproduce. Like, you get me, bro? And this type of thinking can lead to very dark places if taken to their logical conclusions. It's a pretty small leap from there to what the Elysian was saying, or to, as Maester Seymour said, if all life were to end in Spira, all suffering would end. Nietzsche called this pessimism and the nihilism that comes from Schopenhauer's philosophy a will to nothing. After you defeat the dragon and get to see some of the consequences of your earlier decisions, you get to face the god of this world, the Sinistral. And the Sinistral has a more balanced take on the philosophy of Schopenhauer and of Buddhism more generally. Directly upon killing God, the Arisen becomes God, but also succumbs to nihilism and loses the will to do anything, symbolized by them being replaced by their pawn after giving up their will to survive. When Nietzsche said that God is dead and we have killed him, and that this leads to nihilism, it wasn't a celebration, it was a lamentation. Now we have seen the philosophies Nietzsche was fighting against, and part of why. Belief in God, or an afterlife, or some other world that is somehow more real, or more permanent, or more important than this material reality, leads one to lose sight of this world. We have seen many atrocities committed by those that were sure they would be rewarded in heaven, or in reincarnation, or for some ideal that didn't come to pass. Loss of a belief in such a world leaves a person unmoored, adrift, and heartbroken by the promise that was never true. This nihilism can result in just as much evil being put into the world. So Nietzsche came up with the idea of the Ubermensch, or the Overman, as somebody who overcomes nihilism, and tried to figure out what it would take to become such. But we have some loose ends to tie up for now. Arisen. Forgive me. All I've done is test your will. It is the fate of all of us. You and I are swept in the current, same as the next. Each temple is the position of the next. And the endless cycle continues. And so, until the coming of a new soul is fit to craft the will to live, someone like you. Until that day. The structure of the plot is an endless cycle, the same events repeating forever in an unbroken ring. This shows up perhaps most famously in Buddhism, but Nietzsche also explored this idea. Nietzsche had a thought experiment called the Eternal Recurrence. Suppose you had to live this life, exactly the same, an infinite number of times. In the most difficult of times, one would be inclined to curse this idea. But during the best of times, one would be overjoyed. But every joyful moment relies on all the painful moments before it. So Nietzsche's point is that to love any moment in life enough to will it to repeat forever, you must also be able to will that every painful moment be repeated forever, even as you experience them. Thus one property of the Overman is that they love life at every moment. He called this task the heaviest burden, but it is also a liberating one once found. How do we achieve such a thing? Let's take another look at the dragon. What is the dragon that holds our heart and causes pain and destruction and that Nietzsche and Schopenhauer had to deal with? Sorrow. The dragon, sorrow, holds captive that which we hold most dear. For the dragon forged that was knowledge. For our reason it is canonically the bonds with others but the dragon also holds captive our heart. And what does the dragon say? What is your purpose here, Arisen? If you sought to live, you had naught but run and hide yourself away. 
But then, tell me, child of man, what does it mean to live in truth? To wage war against the passing of days. To pray to the unseen for a few breaths more. To raise grand cities from stone and spawn new life in turn. Mankind has done this, yes, and more. But is the tapestry you weave truly of your own design? Ah, we eat when hungry, and we sleep when tired of eating. We kill them as we watch them dead. Their kind is easy to fathom. They go on living from simple fear of death. come to face death incarnate, arms in hand. I ask again, what is your purpose here arisen? One path to your survival lies in my defeat. Still my heart, and you stay the coming end. Another path before you is to offer up that which you hold most dear. Abandon all delusions of control. No. For the price of a single life, I shall leave this land in peace. As my vanquisher, the duchy would bow to you. Wealth and power are sweet anodyne for heartache. You'll not gainsay my terms are more than generous. If it matters aught, the man who rules this land now won that honor through just such a bargain. The decision is yours, Arisen. Now, choose. here within me.
Look at the contrast in the meaning of life between what Grigori says before the fight and during it. If you had sought to live, you had not but run and hide yourself away, versus fight, cling to life, and take back your life, the surge of blood that tethers you to this world. The difference lies in the answer you intrinsically give to, what does it mean to live in truth? It is this question which the dragon requires an answer from us. It is also what Nietzsche claimed the overman needed to have an answer for. Where Schopenhauer saw the world as being the will to survive of a single connected entity, and this seemingly peaceful and loving idea drove him to pessimism and a will to nothing. Nietzsche saw the world as made up of the will to power of separate entities, and hoped that finding one's own will to power would present a path to overcoming pessimism and nihilism. I'm no expert at the German language, but an important distinction to make here is that the word Nietzsche uses for power in the original German is Macht, and what we might more closely associate to the English connotations of power is closer to the German word Kraft. Kraft meaning power in the physical sense, where Macht is a more general type of power, simply the ability to enact one's will. In this sense, the will to power is the will to gain the ability to enact one's will. Or just personal will, self-determination, individuality. It is the will for that which one loves. It is the will for that which gives one joy. Putting that all together, we get a better idea of the overman. The overman is somebody who is self-determined. Somebody who knows themselves, who knows their own will their own individuality. I would argue that finding one's own will requires great contemplation and playful experimentation. Perhaps the kind of experimentation you can do in a cyclical world where your smallest choices can have larger impacts. So what is the dragon's dogma? Find your own will, your individuality, figure out for yourself what gives you joy and overcome the nihilism brought on by the death of the gods in their shadows. And to do all that, say yes to life. Thank you all for watching to the end. I really appreciate it. It makes me feel like someone is getting some value out of my videos. You can validate me even further by liking the video or leaving a comment or subscribing. Or if you're feeling a little spicy, you can leave a comment telling me how I can improve. You can also, if you'd like, give me money over on coffee.com slash omniliquid. Doing so would help me to survive while I make more of these videos and get better at editing and writing, and all the other things. Once again, really, thank you for watching. Now go out, make the world a better place, as I know you will.